Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, when Wild Kingdom aired in the 1960s and 70s, many of the episodes documented wildlife research efforts. Marlon and Jim accompanied scientists all over the world to observe animals and their natural behaviors. Some of the techniques you'll see in tonight's episodes are no longer necessary by today's standards, but the work is still just as important. Wild Kingdom took viewers to the far corners of the world and cultivated an appreciation for animals and their habitats. Marlon and Jim showed us the importance of preserving the natural world, not just for animals, but for our very own quality of life. And that's good news for all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha. Hello. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In our travels through the wilderness areas of the world, Jim Fowler and I have seen many strange animals and animals behaving in strange ways. Today we're going to show you some of the strangest of all. Marlon, I think we have one of the strangest animals in the world right here. This is the two-toed sloth, and he spends his entire life hanging upside down. His hair has even adapted so that it parts on his stomach and hangs down over his sides. And I think another thing that's very strange about the sloth is that instead of using speed to escape his enemies, he simply sees how slowly he can move so that they can't see him. Another odd thing about this animal is the fact that he has two toes on his front feet and three toes on his hind feet. And if he catches you with those claws, he can really do damage. I'd better get him out of here. Although he comes from the tropical rainforests of South America, no one corner of the Wild Kingdom has a monopoly on odd animals or strange patterns of behavior. We find them everywhere. Often animals, like people, behave in quite amusing ways during courtship. I saw one example of this in Africa. The ostrich, of course, doesn't fly, so it really has little use for its wings, except during courtship. To attract a mate, the male displays his fine plumage and makes a drum out of his own body by rhythmically hitting his head against his rib cage. When he's won his mate, the male ostrich stays with her for the rest of the season and helps raise the family. Western America is the scene of an even more elaborate courtship ritual. The performers here are grebes, handsome birds that make their nests in the marshlands where they spend their days fishing. At mating season, there is a great competition to attract attention and win favor. Strangely enough, Although the grebes migrate long distances, they fly only by night. During the daytime, they're reluctant to take wing. Even though they are not web-footed, they are able to lift their bodies almost entirely out of the water with a rapid churning action of the feet. This aquatic toe dance is the most amazing courtship ritual in all of the Wild Kingdom. For some, the work of building a nest is already well underway. For others, the courtship dance goes on. Here's 
a really strange bird, a cross between a Canada goose and a snow goose. Every gander guards his nest, and since the nests are close together, every intruder is challenged. Secretary Bird of Africa puts on quite a different show, stomping a snake to death. With its loose plumage and long scaly legs, the bird offers a poor target for the strike of a venomous snake. The Secretary Bird is related to the eagles. And while it enjoys a varied diet, it's especially partial to snakes. The bird was named long ago when the upstanding plumes were thought to resemble quill pens tucked behind the ears of a secretary. But I'm sure no secretary on her lunch hour ever dined like this. With the help of a friend in Bechuanaland, I sought out one of the strangest sights in all Africa, a dog town. These are African wild dogs. The females raise their pups in the same den, and it becomes a kind of community nursery where each mother takes her turn in feeding and caring for all of the pups. And when there are 30 or 40 pups to care for, it's quite a job. These young pups react to every move that the female makes, and they'll soon leave the den to follow her on the hunt. Another strange method of caring for the young is that of the opossum, who carries her young on her back. They hold on for dear life as she's forced across a narrow stretch of water. Uh-oh, man overboard. And this is a bad place for a possum to learn to swim. But the piggyback method is a good one after all and the gator will have to shop somewhere else for his food. Sometimes the strange ways of animals can cause people to behave in strange ways. For instance, in the heart of the great Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia, I saw a man digging for fish. Yes, digging for fish. His name is Johnny Hickok. Johnny goes fishing with a post hole digger, cutting down through the tangle of roots and matted humus that form floating islands in the swamp. These floating islands give the region its name, Land of Quaking Earth. Johnny is an authentic swamper, born and raised here. He could fish in the open waters, but he knows a better way. Drop a line down under an island. That's where the fish go to feed. It's something like ice fishing, only a good deal warmer. 
Johnny says it isn't luck. You just have to understand fish. I guess we can call it a good example of applied research. In Australia, I went along on a more scientific research project with Dr. Tim Ely of Monash University. At the start, the dog was the most important member of the team. We were hunting for echidna, and since they have a habit of burying themselves in the ground, we had to rely on the dog to track one down and point out its hiding place. The dog's work was finished when he located our quarry. It was up to us to dig it out. The echidna surely qualifies as one of the strangest of all animals, because while it's a mammal, it lays eggs in the manner of a reptile. Another strange feature is a sharp spur on each hind foot of the male only. The echidna resembles a porcupine or hedgehog and is protected with similar prickly spines. It's an anteater going after the ants with its long tube-like muzzle. And for digging, it has long spade-like claws on all four feet. This strange creature looks even stranger when he's wired for sound. Actually, he's wired with a radio transmitter. Dr. Ely's project is to study the home range of the echidna, find out where and how far it travels. And since it's usually hidden, and does most of its traveling by night, he tracks it by radio signal. And away goes the Wild Kingdom's wildest walkie-talkie. A directional antenna picks up the signal and the swing of the needle locates the animal. Readings are taken along a line staked out across the area. And by the process of triangulation, his movements can be traced. So modern science catches up with one of the world's most ancient creatures. Among the many other strange inhabitants of Australia are the phalangers, which are related to the North American opossums we saw before. They're wonderfully equipped for climbing up trees and coming down. Catapulting itself from a high limb, the flying phalanger stretches out flaps of skin attached to its body and legs and glides to earth. What fun that must be! The phalangers make up a large family. Smallest is the pygmy glider, also called the feather tail glider, for a pretty obvious reason. He's only six inches long, and half of that six inches is feather tail. Vernon Mullet, director of the Healesville Sanctuary, introduced me to another animal that's out of this world, the strange and wonderful duck-billed platypus. The platypus lives mainly in the water. It's a big eater and spends most of the time scouring the bottom with that leathery bill, picking up worms, grubs, crayfish, and other bits of food. With its eyes closed, it swims with its front feet only, using its rear feet and flat tail as rudders. Like the echidna, it's an egg-laying mammal, a living relic of a far distant age in the evolution of the wild kingdom.
there seems to be no end to the strange creatures you find in Australia. When the tide goes out, fish that dwell on the bottom are often left behind in the mud. Among them are those odd members of the goby family called mud skippers. This is a small one. It looks more like a tadpole than a fish. That isn't surprising because full-grown mud skippers look like frogs, and they behave quite a bit like frogs. They frequently come out of the water and hop about on land, using their powerful pectoral fins as legs. Their eyes are like periscopes, protruding above the head and turning about in their sockets. When they blink, they seem to swallow those eyes. They sometimes take out after one another, and when aroused, they flash the dorsal fin up and down. The puffed out jowls are enormous gill chambers in which they store water. This is to moisten their gills so they may remain out of the water on land. Where land animals must come out of the water to breathe, mud skippers must go in the water to breathe. What a crazy mixed up world they live in. Sometimes animals that are not especially strange in themselves behave quite surprisingly when they meet other animals. I've never found it very easy though to witness such encounters. Have you, Jim? No, I haven't. You have to be patient or you have to be lucky. I was lucky once though on a trip through southern Georgia. I discovered a den of foxes and staked myself out to watch the cubs. They were having a fine time playing around in the front yard while father kept watch nearby. The cubs seemed to be about eight or nine weeks old. They weren't about to venture very far from the safety of the den. The first indication that something was amiss came from the father. Then one of the cubs saw it a king snake. Now this is a perfectly harmless snake, but the cub doesn't know that. He's just beginning to learn who's who in his world. This is one way to meet a snake, all right. The snake probably wanted to use the den to escape from the sun. And the cub? Well, as we said, animals often do strange things. I moved around to where I could get a better view when I spotted a red-shouldered hawk keeping an eye on a hog-nosed snake. And snakes are its main diet. The hawk uses his sharp talons and strong beak to quickly immobilize his prey. The drab brown color of his plumage indicates that this is a very young bird, but it looks as if he's already learned the art of catching his prey. A water hole attracts many kinds of snakes. A rat snake is not poisonous, but it has a much more aggressive nature than the hog nose. And the little fox is about to learn that all snakes don't behave in the same way. satisfied his appetite and he has no desire for a meal of rat snake but the rat snake doesn't know this nothing in the bewildered hawks experience tells it to be afraid of snakes the snakes experience tells it to fight
Life in the wild kingdom is full of surprises, and a lot of them occur at a crowded water hole. When a wild turkey comes down to take a drink, the cub's instinct tells him to attack. is more of a pest than a threat. The turkey is annoyed, but is also determined to get a drink of water. And the fox gives up. In the quiet backwaters of a swamp, I caught sight of a fox squirrel, just as he caught sight of a bobcat. As the squirrel moved to get away, he found his path blocked by another bobcat. So he went up. A bobcat can climb, but just then he got wind of that other cat. One was obviously poaching in the territory of the other. I don't know which was the intruder, but I did know trouble was brewing. They were about the same size, but they were in no hurry to tangle and took their time sizing each other up. <laughs> the squirrel took this opportunity to make a strategic getaway. Then the cats really went at each other. But the fight ended rather suddenly when one rolled over on his back. In effect, he was crying uncle. And when he did so, the other cat simply could not bring himself to attack. Marlin, the action of that bobcat in not killing its opponent might strike some people as being rather strange. But really, it's an unwritten law of nature and it keeps animals of the same species from killing each other and therefore ensures their survival. Yes, Jim. Among animals, the basic drive to survive as an individual and as a species shows itself in many ways. The world is filled with strange animals, but perhaps of all living animals that we've seen, the strangest of all is the echidna. And yet, until comparatively recent times, no one but the Aborigines of Australia knew that he existed. That's one of the great attractions of the animal world. Its wonders never cease. I suppose that the sum total of everything we know about animals is just about equaled by the sum total of what we don't know. That's why we go on studying, exploring, investigating. For we know that there will always be fresh surprises in store for us as we continue to probe the mysteries of the wild kingdom. The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com.
Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.